for this guided meditation, I'm going to do a loving kindness guided meditation. I don't know if you've done this one before, but first of all, be kind to your body. How are you sitting right now? Can you make your body more comfortable? Start with your part of your body furthest from your brain. In today's world, many people have so much in their brain, they can think about their feet, they don't have experience of those feet. Even my teacher Ajahn Chah used to tell us, the Western monks, you've all got stupid feet. We keep on hitting our feet on rocks or uh, injuring them on the roots of trees. He was right, our feet didn't get any of the mindfulness or kindness. So right now, how are your feet positioned? See if you can move them, experiment, investigate to make them more comfortable. And honestly, on retreats, if it's not too cold, sometimes it's great to take off the shoes and take off the socks as well, because right now I'm feeling the floor under the bare soles of my feet. And it feels quite delightful and interesting. Instead of insulating myself from life, I'm letting myself feel life. And then, scan the attention up past the feet, through your lower legs. And as you go up your body, please be kind to whatever you meet as you explore the feelings in your body, the sensations. As I get up now to my knees, I can experience the sensations in my knees. We have to do it quite rapidly, more rapidly than I would like, but nevertheless. And if you can feel anything which is tight or tense in your knees, learn how to relax those knees. First of all, by maybe changing the position of your legs. Or if that doesn't work, just giving kindness to your knees. Basically, when the mind gives kindness to a part of your body, it makes it feel safe, it makes it relax, and allows healing to come in. So it actually makes your body feel better. And it's something we don't need to take medicines or to uh, do any massage. All you're doing is giving kindness to your own bodily parts. And it relaxes everything and heals it. And you move your attention up through your thighs. If you come across anything which needs attention, then just give it the kindness, the warmth, the sense of I care for you. Just like sometimes when you see somebody and you recognize them, people feel delighted that you recognize them. They feel they're not neglected. They feel when they receive your kindness, they feel more at ease. Just the same way the parts of your body you haven't really looked at for a long time. Just recognizing them makes them relax and feel at ease. And I go up to my butt, and my buttock sitting on the chair. You know when I started, I wasn't mindful of my butt. 
And that's why that was uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable now. I'm going to adjust it. It does make it feel better. To go up from my butt, up my back. As I scan up my back, I make sure that all of the vertebrae are in a comfortable position. Sometimes I stretch my back to make it straight. Sometimes, like today, I'm leaning against the back of the chair. Today, the back of the chair feels more comfortable. And I go up my torso, up the intestines, up to the stomach, to the lungs. I'm mindful. When I see a place which needs some kindness, I'll give it that kindness. It's almost like saying, actually everything is pretty good right now. But say if I had a tummy ache, I'd say to my tummy ache, tummy, May you be happy and well. In whatever way I can give kindness, sometimes I imagine a golden light coming from my heart. And instead of spreading to another human being or another living being, I spread it to my own stomach. That's a living being as well. And I give it the kindness. And one thing with mindfulness is you always get feedback. You see whether that feeling in your stomach gets better or gets worse. And that's how you learn. You learn not just how to relax your body, you learn what kindness really is. You practice, and if it really is kindness, you'll make that part of the body feel more at ease. People assume they know what kindness is. That assumption is dangerous. And as you move up the body, till you get to your shoulders, you relax the shoulders as much as you can. Down the arms, relax the arms and the fingers. Back up to your neck making sure your head is well balanced on top of the neck. If there's any unusual t tension or tightness in your neck or shoulders, pause and give it as much kindness as you possibly can, saying things like, the door of my heart is open to you. Let things in, don't keep them out. When you open a door, let things in. <laughs> the door just opened. <laughs> it's also the door is to go out later, but not now. Welcome. And then you go to your head, you relax the muscles in the front of your face. So everything feels at ease there. The one thing I sometimes do then I look at, I imagine, I use imagination a lot. I imagine my brain. My brain's been busy working, so it's tired. And sometimes your brain doesn't get any rest at all. So I imagine just opening my skull, just imagine it, and taking your poor brain, lifting it out from your skull, and put it putting your brain in a little basket which has got a nice um, soft cushion on the bottom and a nice doona at the top and a lovely pillow and putting your brain in that little basket to give it a nice rest and say brain you deserve a rest once the meditation is over I'll lift you up and put you back in your workstation again I don't know that really helped me. And so you relax the whole body as much as possible. 
And now, imagine a circle around your head, like a sphere. And inside that sphere is all the events, people, experiences, which you like, which you approve of. In there are all your friends and loved ones. And just outside the circle, on the edge, are those people you don't really hate, but they sometimes are irritating. It could be experiences of your body, which are sometimes irritating. They're not too painful. It could be like tiredness. That's just on the edge of the circle. And further away are the people, your enemies, people who have really hurt you in the past. As you go further away from the centre of the circle, it's experiences and people who really gave you a hard time. Now imagining that circle expanding, getting bigger and bigger, the diameter expanding. As you're not trying to cure or fix up all those bad experiences or irritating people, you're just expanding your circle of what you can accept in. So you're making peace with these people and experiences. First of all, just those experiences or people who are just irritating. And once you can include those in, it's easier to include other experiences which are harder to bear, more painful. And the cancers, the loss of people, the separations, those also start to get included as part of life, as part of you. And then you expand that circle, that sphere, even larger, to include more and more things and people into your world. Once you start expanding that circle, it gets more and more fun, more and more delightful. To exclude somebody is very, very <sighs> unpleasant. To exclude things which you cannot change. So now you start to expand your circle of loving kindness. The door of my heart becomes more and more wide including more and more experiences and people and things until that your doors are so wide that everything is invited in. You're not trying to cure things but caring for everything. It's another way of looking at loving kindness. How do you feel? How is your bodily feelings and how is your sense of peace and being at ease with the world? And now please open your eyes to end the meditation. Good. Excellent. <coughs> so that's... Uh, have you got a question? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, so look, what is it? Can I have rain? It's brain back. Brain back, oh yeah. Out, okay, check it out, yeah. No, leave it out. Much better. <laughs> yeah, okay, joke, yeah. I didn't see it. I thought it was rain back. I thought you wanted your money back. <laughs> And there's one thing which I will always promise you. Any talk, any function, anything which we ever do, if you want to ask for your money back, you always can. I promise. You can always ask. 
you won't get, you can ask. <laughs> Excellent. So, going to talk about kindfulness rules. Now, that was the subject of the talk. And the kindfulness was something which um, I invented that word. And the reason why I invented it, because you often found that just mindfulness was not enough either to heal your body or to make your mind peaceful or to make your mind alert. And one of the reasons I became a Buddhist when I was 18, no, actually 17, was that the compassion, the kindness was something which was so beautiful. And it even got to the point, this kindness and compassion, but when I started reading up about Buddhism, the, there was no punishment anywhere in Buddhism. Especially for the monastic community, if we make any mistake, if we do something wrong, we're not punished. Instead, we're saying, please acknowledge what you've done. Once you acknowledge what you've done, number two, just... Uh, Give amnesty, now ask that forgiveness, and lastly, that becomes the, the, the next story, and then learn from it, grow from it. You know, I used to be a school teacher for one year in a high school, actually in, shouldn't that far, in Devon, in Ottery St. Mary, King's, King's School there. I don't know if any of you know that place, it's only a small school, but it's very beautiful. And that's where I lost all my hair, <laughs> pulling it out <laughs> with the kids. But one thing which I did there was it was teaching maths. Should I tell the maths joke? <laughs> <laughs> I can't control that. I can't control that, okay. Is there any maths teachers here? Oh, there is one, I've got one, okay, great. So, simple arithmetic. Listen carefully. 26 sheep in a field. 10 die. How many survive? You can help him if you like, because mass teachers need help. <laughs> How many survive? I'll say it again. 26 sheep in a field. 10 die. How many survive? I'll give you a wrong answer there. Wrong. No, it's wrong. The answer is 10. Listen carefully. That's a problem with people. I don't know if that happens to you in a school. When I taught my school uh, children, they would never listen. Twenty sick sheep in a field. <laughs> ten die. <laughs> so only ten survive. <laughs> you know, one of the reasons you know, I, I tell jokes like this is to keep people's attention. But anyway, when I had to, to set an examination at the end of the year for these children, and then I had to make, set the paper, and I'd never done that before. So I went to the, one of the other senior teachers. How to set an examination for the kids in the school? And they gave me this wonderful advice, which I have extended to advice for life. They said, don't make it too hard. If the exam is too difficult, then what it means is that they get low score, maybe only 30% or 20%, and they will come out thinking they cannot do math. If you make it too easy, so they'll get 90%, 95%, then they don't learn anything. It's just like telling them two easy questions. So the senior um, teacher in maths at that school told me, Try and aim for 70%. Because 70%, if that's the average score, the kids who go there think, yes, they can do maths. You're actually encouraging them. And the most important part of that was the 30% where they make mistakes. That's for me, the teacher, to learn what I thought they understood, but they hadn't understood. And to me, that became the most important part of the test, is I'm getting feedback of what they didn't really learn. 
And part of it was my fault, but not sort of emphasizing enough, you know, some of the skills of mathematics. And so because of that, I extended that the 70% rule of life. If you're really, really, really successful, you may have fun, but you learn nothing. If you make too many mistakes, you get depressed. So if you can manage in your life to get around 70%, in other words, you're not the richest person in Stroud, you're not the poorest, you're not the, the most advanced, but you're not sort of the worst, you're 70%. That is the best score. Because there's 30% where you fail, you make mistakes. That is how you learn. If you don't make any mistakes in life, how can you learn? It's from the mistakes you know, we learn to do better next time. The Buddha actually called that growth in Buddhism. You make mistakes, you admit them, you don't hide them. And you learn from your mistakes, make sure you don't do it ever again. What it was telling me was mistakes are allowed. That's part of life, and that's how we learn. So if any of you are married or looking for a partner, or you're having trouble with a relationship, please never find a guy who is 100%. That will drive you crazy. Never find a guy who's maybe 50% or below. That will also drive you crazy. Find a guy who's about 70%. In other words, imperfect, makes mistakes, but still is wonderful. Just like you, imperfect. That's why sometimes when I do marriage counselling, the two people would come up and they would say, my husband's like this. And then their husband would say, but my wife is like this. I'd say, well, you're both imperfect. You're a good match. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this is, the other, this, is, this is a story, but it's a funny story. There was this guy, and he was just, he was a brilliant student, and he was also very, very wealthy. He became a billionaire. And once he had, you know, really sort of a good amount of money in the bank, and he was very, very learned, and he thought, well, I'm so handsome and rich. I want to marry the most beautiful girl in England. And so he went to look for the most beautiful girl, first of all in London, and he found this really beautiful woman. Oh, she was like on the front pages of these magazines. And then he went out with her, but found out her... Uh, her faults. She couldn't cook. She was a hopeless cook. So he said, no, I can, I can do better than her. So he didn't bother about her, but so he went over to Oxford. And in Oxford, he found this incredibly beautiful girl, more beautiful than the first. And she was not, a, not just an ordinary cook. She was running two restaurants which were amazing and very popular. And so he thought, wow, this is a girl for me. She's an excellent cook, very beautiful. But then when he sort of went out with her, he found she was stupid. She was a great cook and looked good, but he couldn't have a conversation about anything with her. She just didn't know. So, so he dumped her. And then he came to Stroud. <laughs> And in Stroud, she saw this woman who was incredibly beautiful. And she owned four restaurants. And she had two PhDs. She knew so much about everything. So he went out with her, and he thought, this is the girl for me. So he proposed to her, and she said no, because she was looking for the perfect man. In other words, we always look for someone else who's perfect, but are you the perfect person to be able to live with someone like that?
Don't try and, you were laughing. <laughs> Not perfect. <laughs> so look, if you're looking for somebody to share your life with, try and find someone who's 70%. That's the best. So a partner who's 70%, you can't do better than that. But more than that, I haven't told this story yet, this is a powerful Buddhist story, that you know, some people in this world you know, have got big problems. Sometimes they are disabled, either emotionally disabled, uh, or they're physically disabled. They may not look as handsome, as beautiful as you expect. They may not be able to serve in this world so well. And some of them feel that they, are, they don't belong in this world. There's something wrong with them. They feel that they are oh, just not respected. What do you do? Remember just giving this uh, talk at, it was a mental health week over in Australia, and I was asked to give a lecture to what they call the victims of the mental health service. In other words, the people who were um, trying to find some solutions and some understanding and freedom within the mental health service. This was over in Australia. And they told me afterwards that when I first, they first saw me, they thought, who is this brown-robed monk coming to tell us? I've got no degrees in mental health. I didn't study mental health. I'm just a Buddhist who meditates. But they said I made them laugh and cry when I told them the story of the forest. I haven't studied uh, mental health, but I have seen many, many forests throughout the world, whether it's in Sri Lanka, or in Bhutan, or in Thailand, in Malaysia, and in, obviously in Australia. And every time I go into a forest, Sometimes, just for fun, I look for the perfect tree. One which is dead straight, with all the limbs and branches in the proper places, with no damage on the bark, with all the leaves nice and green, without any sort of uh, leaves being eaten by bugs. In all my life, I've never seen a perfect tree like that anywhere in the world. And anyway, ones which are close to perfect, I don't really like. They're actually quite boring, they're like plastic trees. But the ones which I really like, what do you like? The trees which are all bent and crooked, with the, the branches all over the place, and with many of those uh, leaves, like now in UK, you know, it's like the winter time, or not the the autumn time now, many of those leaves are brown, they're falling off. It's gorgeous. I was told once when I went to Canada, and it was, a, the, they call it the fall time there, autumn time, all the leaves were turning so brown, they said I could walk into the forest and I'd have perfect camouflage. <laughs> <laughs> Which was true. But anyway, it's, uh, my favourite trees in the forest are all the bent and crooked and damaged ones. And I said that if you are bent and crooked, imperfect and damaged, number one, you belong. You're not excluded from the natural forests of our world. I don't think there's a person here who's perfect. You've all got their silly idiosyncrasies. My stupidities are telling, telling jokes, bad jokes, and a very kind of you to actually to laugh sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but each one of you have got your idiosyncrasies which make you imperfect. And some of you are really damaged. 
If you've got, if you are damaged goods, number one, you belong in the forest, and number two, you are the most beautiful trees in the forest. Check out the next time you go for a walk in the forest. The damaged, bent trees, the crooked all over, they're the ones you love the most. So this is actually changing our perception of what kindfulness is. You're aware, you're not, um, you're not uh, changing what you see, but you're looking at it in a different way. You're aware with kind perception. You see the damaged goods and you find a beautiful place for them, a place of honor. I told this story recently. Now that when I was at university, I was over in Cambridge, I volunteered to actually to go one, one day a week the Fulbourn Hospital, and that was the hospital close by for people with you know, mental or emotional difficulties. Sometimes some students went there when they had breakdowns. The only reason I went there was because one of my friends, he was a very devout Christian, he said, are we Christians? We're going to do some social service. And I was the only Buddhist they knew. And so, okay, if you Christians are going to do that, I'll do that as well. I was just like flying the flag for Buddhism, that's all. I wasn't really interested in doing anything good. <laughs> I just, I wasn't going to let those Christians outdo me. <laughs> I was being honest. But the truth was, those Christians who I went with first of all, I think they, they stopped going after about three or four weeks. I kept going for two years. This is where I learned what social service really is. It wasn't I was giving, I was getting so much, learning so much, because I was helping out with occupational therapy for those people with Down's syndrome. And so, going every week for two years, I got to know them and appreciate them and value them. And sometimes they blew my mind, just the wisdom which they had. They couldn't express it in great words. These days we call it emotional intelligence. And I told that story, you can remember this, that uh, when I turned up one afternoon on a Thursday to help out, one of the Down syndrome men, you know, who knew me really well, they took one look at me, and they gave me this huge hug. It was the first time he'd ever done that. I said, what do you do that for? And he said, something's gone wrong, hasn't it? You could see my face and sense that I had some great disappointment. And what had happened was that night before, I broke up with my girlfriend. Other people didn't see that. He saw it straight away. And that really just shook me. I really started respecting people who maybe did not have the ability to express their thoughts and emotions in, in great words, but certainly knew how to feel deeper than I ever knew. That taught me just the respect for others. It's not that somehow or other someone is disabled, but their abilities are in other areas which our world sometimes doesn't respect. This is one of the reasons why it's almost impossible to judge anybody these days or devalue a person and think you don't belong. Every one of you do belong, no matter who you are. So anyway, that in fact, it wasn't they just belong, they taught me stuff. They taught me how not to judge people and how to be kind to people. And one of those little stories was just after a couple of years, they trusted me so much that they asked me to look after, there's like two classes in the occupational therapy unit for those with Down syndrome. I looked after one class for the first session in the afternoon 
then they had the tea break, which was England. And after the tea break, they asked me to look after the other class. I never suspected a thing. But after the second class finished, the two classes came together, and the people who were supposed to be organising this unit said, no, we found out that next week is your final exams, so this will be the last time you're coming. And they all got together, you know, these kids, to actually to make cards, make little gifts, whatever they could, because they were expressing their love for me. It was a good friend, the longest serving volunteer. And that really meant so much to me. They gave me the kindness. But you know, it was very embarrassing when I said afterwards, actually, my final exams are not for another 10 days. I can come next week. Please let me come. <laughs> <laughs> so I went for one more week there. And that was really beautiful. They taught me that kindness, that softness, that emotional sensitivity, which is beautiful. So anyhow, when I say kindfulness, now you get some idea what it means. It's a beauty. And we have a big Buddha statue up there. I was looking at that. Uh, came from uh, Lucky, where are you? Over there somewhere, yeah. He just loaned it to us today. You know what a Buddha statue is? That's um, fiberglass. So why do people like monks and Buddhists bow down three times to a Buddha statue? <coughs> Is that just worshipping idols? You know, do you know what you're doing when you do that? The body can't bend, the mind can't bend. My body can't bend, the mind can't bend. Body can bend. You know, have you ever, ever done yoga? Sometimes what I've seen, some of these people bending. What that actually means is uh, something which I've taught for so many years over in Australia. And to get like... Australians who have never understood Buddhism before, and they're not even Buddhists, for them to bow three times to a Buddha statue. Why? And I told them, this actually story happened when I got an invite to teach at the morning assembly of a top Christian school in Perth. I knew the chaplain, you know, from work with the Cancer Foundation, he said, no, why don't you come and give a talk on our morning assembly? And so I agreed. And so before the assembly, I had to wait outside the hall with the chaplain and the headmaster, the principal. And the principal turned to me and said, that this is a Christian school, you know, a very sort of devout Christian school. So when we go into the hall there, there's a, a statue of Jesus. And he said, we are going to the chaplain and I are going to do a little bow to Jesus. But you're a Buddhist monk, you don't have to. And I am rebellious. And so when he said that, I said, I demand my right to bow to your statue of Jesus. <laughs> That's what I said. And he was a bit taken aback. He was trying to be nice to a, you know, an invited guest. The chaplain knew me really well, so he said, yeah, that's such a bum, it's okay. And then I explained why. I said, I can always see something in your statue of Jesus which I can respect. That's what I'm going to bow to. And then I gave the whole morning assembly talk on that, about why we pay respects by doing a little bow to somebody. That's what we respect. In Sri Lanka, you know, sometimes your children bow to the parents. Why? You're not the Buddha, you're not perfect, but it's the symbol of being a, a parent. That's one of the reasons why we pay respect. But anyway, that when I said that when I bow to a Buddha statue, the first bow I give is to virtue, to goodness, to truth, to honesty, to trust because those are really important in my life. It's very easy to worship that, to bow my head low, because I venerate goodness, virtue, you know, in Buddhism like precepts so much. And my second bow 
is to peace. You know what we do in meditation, develop peace. Peace in the family, peace in the community, peace in our world. Even like peace in your body, so you can sit here with no great sicknesses or illnesses. And of course, peace in the mind and the meditation. That is fantastic to get so deep in meditation, the body vanishes and you bliss out, and your mind becomes so clear. I venerate that. So it's easy to bow my head down to peace. And lastly, I started off by bowing down to wisdom, but these days I bow down to compassion and kindness. Whenever you see a beautiful act of kindness in the world, like for example, the two people who are actually letting us stay in their house this evening. It's a beautiful act of kindness. Thank you for that. And poor Kareem, he's, I think, is it a vegan that you are or vegetarian? But nevertheless, he told us he's going to try and fry an egg for us tomorrow morning. <laughs> he never fried an egg before. <laughs> okay, anyway, that's lovely kindness. Thank you. And acts of kindness are something which brings like beautiful warmth and light into this world. And every time, time you see a real, honest, um, unexpected act of kindness, what does it do to you? It just brings out this beautiful hope and joy that there's great possibilities in this world to overcome difficulties. There's one of the stories I read recently. There was a, a woman, I think she was Austrian. She was getting very old but she was one of twins. And both of those twins, you know, they came from Jewish parents, Second World War. And those two twins were taken into Auschwitz. You know, and Dr. Mengele doing experiments on these Jewish twins. He said she was, I don't know if you call it fortunate, because she also suffered immensely. It was her sister who had all the worst experiments done on her, and she died in the camp. She somehow survived. And she carried that trauma with her for so long. And then she noticed this elderly man, I think in Argentina, and she recognized him as one of the junior doctors at that time in Auschwitz. One of the people who had you know, tortured her sister for the purposes of so-called medical research. And so she wrote him this letter, said, I know who you are, meet me in Auschwitz. And this you know, doctor, you know, thought he'd escaped for so many years, sort of actually said, yes, I'll go there. And he felt so guilty, felt as this past was eating away at his, at his essence of being. It was you know, his heart. So he turned up there. When he turned up, and she met him in Auschwitz, she said to him, I forgive you. It's the wrong thing you did. But just the anger has been eating away at me for about 40 or 50 years. So I forgive you. And she wrote a nice article about it afterwards, which I wrote that when you forgive almost the unforgivable acts, she said now she's no longer a victim but a victor. She'd conquered that ill will, one of the most hardest of ill wills to actually to, to accept. And the, the doctor, I think he was eventually put in jail. But it was wonderful that he could be forgiven by one of the people he'd hurt so much. That meant so much to him. So those are acts of kindness and compassion. When I read those, that creates a beautiful light in this world. It tells me that there's nothing that is so bad that can't be forgiven. By forgiveness, I don't mean just, oh, it's okay. I mean, you who've been hurt so much can forgive and then you are free. 
the person who did that terrible thing, it's great that they have to recollect what they did. Know the consequences. Never have to do that ever again. To learn from it. I tell some of the, so that's the act of kindness. Whenever you see a beautiful act of kindness, then, of course, it brings such beauty into this world. That's why I bow to compassion, kindness, on my third bow. And that's why I bow to the Buddha. Virtue, peace and compassion. When I told that story in this uh, very strong Christian church, then afterwards the principal asked, can we come to visit your monastery? So I arranged about three busloads of kids to my monastery. They actually came into the cave where I live. You know what they said? They said, a great place for a rave. <laughs> 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 it's my meditation cave. But anyway, but then the principal also came. And that surprised me, because he's a very busy man. And then he asked to go into our main hall. In our main hall we have in a big Buddha statue about ten times the size of this one. And then we both bowed together three times in front of the Buddha. He's a strong Christian, but he said, I can see something beautiful you know, in the act of bowing. I'm bowing to peace. So virtue, peace and compassion, just like you. Why not? So these are the things where you have some kindness and mindfulness, they go together. They break down barriers between people. When they go further than that, and we're going for time, oh yeah. Further than that, when you have mindfulness, peace and compassion, or you have kindfulness, that's great for your practices of meditation. I don't know why people meditate or how they've been taught but I do know that one of the first times, I was in Thailand for many years, and then down to Australia, and then when I went to Malaysia to teach some meditation, I could not believe it. That people were complaining about meditation headache. And I've never seen that before. How can you meditate and have meditation headache? Because I always teach people, if you have headache, meditate, it gets rid of the headache all sorts of other things in your body. And so many times when I was sick as a young man, a young monk, it was the kindness which was so important to heal me. I remember so many times I did come from a poor family over in a council flat, over in Acton. Uh, I never realised at the time, as a kid you don't know if you're poor or you're wealthy or what. But what was happening was uh, most of the kids in the school in my class were all migrants. And I thought that was common all the time. But where there was migrants, that's usually the immigrant population, and they're usually more poor. And so anyway, I took that for granted. But, you know, it was a poor area, and everything which, uh, which I learned there, one of the things which I did learn there, was how to be colorblind. I love that little statement, because there was people from so many different races in that school, because they were migrants. And I learned how to, if somebody, I was into football at that time, you know that it was really weird. I really sometimes could blame my teachers, because I was good at football, good at soccer. But they said, there's no future in soccer. You know, just pass your exams and go to university. That's where you can get a good life. Now I found out how much money soccer players make. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, so you know, I was you know, quite poor. And so we used to play soccer instead of in the fields, in the streets, or around the back of the council flats. There was all sort of <coughs> concrete roads there. And so many times you go for a tackle, if you know soccer, and then you, I was always scraping the the skin off my knees. I kind of grew up with scabs on each knee. And I thought that, you know, the, you know that was ordinary. But what, what wasn't ordinary 
But once I you know, went for a tackle, scraped the skin off my knees, I would run to my mother. Mum, I've got blood all over my knees. You know what my mother would do? She would kneel down and kiss it. She called it kissing it better. Did that ever happen to any one of you? Think about it. It's an open wound and your mother is putting her mouth full of germs <laughs> on an open wound. Would you get away with that in hospital? <laughs> but every time it worked. You know, the pain would go away and never got infected. And the pain would go away and two minutes later I was off playing soccer again. I've never, you used to never see that at any of the soccer matches. You never see the trainer going on and somebody gets really injured and they go and kiss it better. <laughs> and they go off playing again. But it worked. And that's why when I did become a monk, and when you remembered those things and started contemplating them, how come it works? Just that kindness is very, very powerful. It's one of the reasons, you know, I've seen, I haven't been in hospital for about 31 years now. I've been in really good health. So I visit people in hospital and I know many doctors and nurses. That's one of the terrible things with those professions now. You don't have time to care. You know, you've got to do the job with so many patients and then also you have to go and um, write reports. Reports, and I don't know who reads the reports. Reports and reports and reports. So you don't have the really quality time with the people you're supposed to be serving. So, but I know how much kindness works. And so that's one of the reasons why many years ago this Sri Lankan man came to see me. He was a, a doctor, an intern at one of the hospitals. And uh, I'd known him ever since he was really small. His family brought him to the temple, so you know, he got to know me, I got to know him. And he came to see me one Saturday morning saying, I cannot do this job any longer. I have to retire. I'll find another job. And he was only about in his early 20s. And I said, all of that study, all of that training, and you want to retire as a doctor or do another job, how come? And then he told me what had happened that very morning. You could still see in his face, he was very traumatized by it. One of his patients, a 23-year-old woman, died that morning, unexpectedly. And he was supposed to be looking after her. If that wasn't enough of a shock, because he was a doctor, it was a Saturday morning, he was the one who had to go and tell her husband, who's got no wife. A young couple, and they really loved each other immensely. And he said that hurt so much. And the worst part was even he had to tell the two children, you've got no mummy anymore. And he said that was just, an impossible thing to do, but he had to do it. He said, I wouldn't, can never face that situation ever again. So he said, I've got to leave. Can you kind of imagine that? You know, you've got uh, a woman who dies unexpectedly, you're the doctor, and you have to tell the young man and the two children, you've got no mummy anymore. It was a shock for them all. They didn't expect her to die. And anyway, when he came and told me that, I said, look, you've misunderstood the purpose, the main purpose of being a doctor. Your main purpose, your priority is not to cure your patients. If you think that's what you're supposed to do, you're going to fail many times. You can't always cure the problems. Your main purpose as a doctor is to care for your patients and their families. Be a carer, not a curer. And if you're a carer, you never need to fail. And even if somebody dies, the whole family know 
you gave it your best. Thank you for trying. You got the message. It's wonderful. It's very smart. And so he went back to work and said, I'm never going to try and cure anymore. I'm going to care for people. And now he's, he's an oncologist. No, not an oncologist. He, he puts those tubes up your backside. <laughs> to find <laughs> colonoscopy. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, gastroid or whatever it is, yeah. But he does it so kindly. <laughs> <laughs> Many of my monks have been to him. You know, they've got something wrong with their digestive system. And, of course, he always does it for free for us. Because we saved his career. So it's wonderful that he got the message there. And it's the same for all of you who are trying to even practice Buddhism to try and cure your defilements. Have you got any defilements, anyone? Any hindrances? <laughs> any greed, hatred and delusion and stuff like that? <laughs> he doesn't have that. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so anyway, don't try and cure them. Care for them. Use the kindfulness. And be amazed just how those things disappear. How can you cure like ill will with more ill will trying to get rid of it? Greed by trying to be somewhere else. Delusion. How can you how can you ever get rid of delusion? You don't know what it is. If you didn't know what it was, it wasn't delusion. So anyway, if you care for things, you get to know them. And it's find out just how stupid they are. The wisdom. You care first, get to know them, and then they leave you. For those of you who know some of the Buddha stories, the Buddha never kicked butt. You know what kicking butt is? That's what the US Marines do. We're going to go and kick butt. Does that ever solve any problems in our world? Of course it never does. You don't kick butt, you go and care. I think many of you here would understand this. But wouldn't it be amazing? Amazing. Instead of throwing bombs in Iraq, you know, you threw like flowers or, or medical supplies or food instead of missiles. Imagine what would happen then. Even over in North Korea, I've been to South Korea many times. I even just, I went over to uh, the demilitarized zone once. They were doing a little ceremony in there to try and create some peace there. And we did a walk with 6,000 South Korean Buddhists in there, in the D DMC, demilitarized zone. It's a very dangerous place. I've got to be honest with you, I was shot many times. I was. I'm being truthful. Shot with cameras. Click. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, it's okay to laugh. <laughs> but also, you know, you met, or found out what was going on on the other side as well. And one of my friends was a monk who spent two years as a monk trying to help a temple in North Korea, a Buddhist temple. And I asked him, was there any problem there? He said, no. They're very happy that someone was helping them. That really shocked me, especially with somebody I knew and trusted. So it gives a different angle what happens there. Sometimes what those politicians, they don't have to be North Korean politicians. Look at some of the British politicians, what they say. <laughs> it's unbelievable sometimes. But nevertheless, sometimes we can, instead of trying to cure problems, care for, prob care for problems, care for people. Instead of trying to cure your husband, instead of trying to cure your wife, try caring for them. You'd be amazed just how effective that is.
So these are the little things where we have that kindfulness. And if you're in meditation, you're very restless, or you have sloth and torpor when you're meditating, for goodness sake, let sloth and torpor be. It's not that bad. There's nothing wrong when you get sleepy. Don't try and cure it. Care for it. Why are you sleepy? Number two, our restlessness in your meditation. That was something which uh, really confused me for such a long time. Restlessness, why is my mind restless? I mean, I've got some nice free time, all I need to do is just to watch the breath, or do some meditation. Why won't my mind do that? And then I realized that the reason I was restless because I had a bad attitude to myself. Are you happy being here right now? If you're happy being here right now, you've got no restlessness, you don't want to go home right now. But if I gave another really bad joke, they'd say, oh, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I mean. I looked at my mind, and why won't my mind stay still? Because I was trying to force it to be still. My mind was scared of me. We were like having a battle. And it had enough of me. It wants to run away. If you have restlessness, it means you do not have sufficient kindness to your mind. This was a lady over in Perth. I admire her so much, her wisdom. She had a kid, maybe five years of age, and one day the kid had a tantrum and shouted out, Mummy, I don't love you anymore, I'm leaving home. <laughs> <laughs> You're not allowed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, what did the mummy do? She was so smart, this is why I admire her. She said, okay darling, I'll help you pack. <laughs> she wasn't an abusive parent, she just loved that kid and had this incredible emotional intelligence. So she went into her son's bedroom, packed a little suitcase, put all the important things in life, like his Superman costume, his lucky pants, and I don't know what else. And said, oh, before you leave, before you leave, uh, you've got to have something to eat. So she made him his favourite sandwich and put it in a brown paper bag. Here's something for lunch. And then they went to the door and she waved her son off. Have a wonderful life, son. Don't forget to keep in touch. And the son left home for the first time, carrying a little suitcase, the brown paper bag with the lunch in it. And it happily just went on the end of the path to the garden gate turned left and went out into its life for the first time, at a five-year-old. About 20 metres down the road, the son felt terribly homesick. <laughs> he was only five years of age. <laughs> so homesick, it turned around and went back in front of the gate, opened the gate, went through the gate. The mother hadn't moved from the front door. Welcome home, darling. How would a five-year-old leave forever. If you abuse it and shout at it, tell it, you can't leave home, you're too young to leave home. No, I'm not allowing it. And of course it might go further. If you're kind to your son or your daughter, really kind, why would your daughter or son ever want to leave home? If you're kind to your mind, why would your mind ever want to wander off anywhere? So these days, after many years of being a monk and a meditator, my mind and I are the best of friends. As honest, this is how it feels, Rajan Brahm, when I sit down to meditate. So before I came here, I had a nice meditation in that bedroom up there. I don't know whose bedroom it is, but it's very nice. Was it yours? Okay, yeah. But anyway, there's a nice room there. So I was sitting down there, yeah, I was tired, but I made friends with my mind. Hey, we've got an hour together. Yeah. So we, we literally chill out together. My mind and I spend this wonderful quality time. No wandering at all. 
while we wander off, if you're with your best friend, your best friend in the world, just the two of you, you won't want to go anywhere. You're happy together. That's what I mean, the kindness, the kindfulness. So we recognize each other, we have a beautiful time together. And that's important for me anyway, because again, the compassion and kindness of Buddhism is one of the things which stood it up against everything else, which was an important path for me. The compassion, the kindness. You know, when I looked through the Eightfold Path, I was looking, where's the Samma Metta, the right kindness, or the right loving kindness? I couldn't find it anywhere at first. But then I was only just beginning my studies of Buddhism. You know where it is? It's in the second noble truth. No, sorry, not noble truth. The second factor of the Eightfold Path, the Samma Sankhapa. Next time you look at that, have a look more deeply. There's three right, and I call them motivations, because that's what it means. The three right motivations, the motivations of letting go, fatinisaka, or renunciation. The second one is awayapada. It literally means non-ill will, but it's used as a synonym for metta, for compassion. It's right there in the second factor of the Eightfold Path, practice right compassion, kindness. You know what the third one is? Ohingsaka, gentleness. That word many people know thanks to Mahatma Gandhi and the Ahingsa doctrine, non-violence, the gentleness. And so when I, that's my fav well, one of my favorite factors of the Eightfold Path, because many people ignore it, or they don't have a good translation. But I stand by that translation of letting go, kindness and gentleness. And that's where it comes from. So when we have kindfulness, we're actually fulfilling the Buddha's teaching and our meditation gets so easy. We enjoy each other's company, my mind and I. Okay, so I think that's enough for the moment. Now we have what we call the three C's. Questions, comments and complaints. <laughs> I know that Q doesn't, is not the first letter of questions, but nevertheless. So, has anybody got any questions about what I've said? Complaints about what I didn't say? Or what else? Questions, comments about anything whatsoever? Yes, thank you. Good question. Um, talking about um, compassion and kindness, and, um, compassion coming from yourself as well as others, where do you draw the line between um, compassion for yourself and others in that you know you, you enter into really difficult situations with people and you can show compassion, you can show kindness, but um, it doesn't alter the situation and it can be quite maybe sometimes abusive yeah. and you, you try and where do you draw the line and it's thinking okay where does compassion for myself come into this and I have to remove myself and I always battle with that um, okay. because sometimes you can show as much compassion and kindness and, and it doesn't seem to alter a situation Yeah. Um, but it feels really uncomfortable and Especially when you're not perfect and you're, yeah. you're struggling and you're trying to kind of work with you know, yeah. the issues. And um, so it's, it's more what we do. Yeah, no, it's, that's a very common question. There's a very easy answer, but a very profound answer. It's like, you know, in Buddhism, most people think that Buddhism is either Theravada or Mahayana. In Theravada, you're just concerned about your own enlightenment. Mahayana, you're putting off your own enlightenment, being compassionate for all other beings. Both are wrong. Buddha never taught those. To understand what I'm saying, not just to get your attention. <laughs> to understand the meaning of what I've said. In ordinary things, one of the duties I do in the world is to give blessings when people get married. 
when they get married, I look at the first partner, usually maybe the bride, and you know, it's a marriage day, she just exchanged the rings, or the handcuffs, I sometimes call them. <laughs> but anyway, just exchanged the rings, and I said, you are now a married woman. From this day on, please don't think of yourself anymore. And she always nods in agreement. She must not think of herself. And then I look at the husband, especially if this is in Australia, and he's an Australian man. I don't know why this is the case. But then I said, you're a married man now. You must not think of yourself. He always hesitates. But he eventually gives in. <laughs> Any Australians here other than me? Okay, good. I'm safe. <laughs> anyway, he says, yes, okay, I won't think of myself. I'm still looking at the husband in the eyes. From this moment on, this day on, you must never think of her again, your wife. Okay, you haven't heard this before because you have the usual result. What on earth is this monk saying? He's either crazy or he just, you know, he's never been married. What are you talking about? I might think of my, my wife, now I'm married. But then I quickly go to the, the new bride and say, from this day on, you must not think of your husband. And I love that time of confusion because now you're all open in your mind to hear, you know, what I'm talking about, the meaning of this. Once you're married, you must never think of yourself. You must never think of your partner. There's a third option. You must only think of us. We're in this together. So once you're married, it's all about us. Sometimes that us will increase, you know, to kids, to family. We think about us from this day on. Not me, not him, not her, us. And if there's a problem, whose problem is it? Our problem. It's amazing that that means you still have that commitment and that love and that kindness. But you don't just give it to your partner. It's to us. Theravada, Mahayana, it's just about my enlightenment or your enlightenment, it's about our enlightenment. We're in this together. So that's why we give to everybody. And don't forget yourself. You're part of this. And then you find it's amazing how many solutions you can find. When you tell the people you're having a problem with, oh, we're in it together. You know, we can't escape. It's about our world. It's not about England, it's not about Ukraine or Russia, it's about our world. Make any sense? Yeah. So may all beings be happy and well. You're a being, aren't you? You're included. Yeah. <laughs> Are you a robot? Have you ever gone online sometimes and you have to tick this box to prove you're not a robot? <laughs> I don't know whether I should tick that because you know, we're all so conditioned. <laughs> we are a robot. <laughs> okay, any, another question? Yeah. Yes, young man. I want to know, when did you come up with the word of kindness? Kindness, I'm not quite sure exactly what year. It was in Hong Kong. And that was 15 years ago, really? Is it? Yeah. I don't know, it's quite a long time. 15 years ago, I started talking about it first of all, and then later on just included it, included it in some books as well. Reading your books. Oh, excellent. Very good. Marvellous. So you got the mindfulness. And mindfulness was always a bit too cold for me. It was just maybe too intellectual. You'll be aware. Aware of what? And sometimes that these days with mindfulness, people have complained that sometimes it's, you know, it's taught to US Marines so they can be more aware when they shoot, shoot people you know, in conflicts. And so you can't do that with kindfulness. 
know that sometimes you know, there's many Buddhists in Sri Lanka and uh, sometimes even the cricket matches. Do you do very well these days? No, not so. You know why? Because there's too many Buddhists in the Sri Lankan cricket team. <laughs> and they're so kind. So, I mean, why would you want to bowl somebody out? That really upsets them. <laughs> You'd never like to hit a six. Or you see the other team just really get disappointed. So a good Buddhist cricket team, they would always lose. <laughs> out of compassion for others. I once thought of starting a Buddhist soccer team. And I thought, you know, when I first went to Australia, I thought, it's important to get those contacts, you know, with those of the other faith and religion. How can you do that? Yeah, you can have discussions or interfaith seminars, but you need something more than that, you know, to build up that friendship. So I thought I'd start a Buddhist soccer team so we could play the Anglicans and the Catholics and the Jews and the Hindus and the atheists. But then I thought, if you did have a Buddhist soccer team, how could they play? If somebody else wanted the ball, let go. <laughs> let go. <laughs> We'd never win a match. We'd have a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, another question? Yeah? The parable of the Buddhist soccer team. Um, it, I think it kind of brings to me um, the fact that sometimes in the world, like those of us that are still kind of living worldly lives, we do have to prioritize sometimes being successful, right? Or right. we have to make advancements in our careers or our relationships or things like that, as long as we're in the world. But do you reckon? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it feels sometimes like the yeah. Buddha Dharma is like pulling me one way, and yeah. then the world is pulling me another. Look, there's many successful companies who actually follow more Buddhist principles. In other words, success, not just of you, but success of the group. You know, they just, we're working together, because in real life, I can't do anything by myself. You need other people to assist and help. There never is like personal success. Yeah, maybe somebody in the front but we always actually are honest and say, I couldn't do this without so many other people who gave me a hand. It's a group. And that's a unit of success. When there's hierarchies, like in business, the boss, sometimes if that boss really, you know, if he's not just as, or she, not just a spokesperson, but the real boss, those hierarchies, they cause so many problems in any business. And just over in life as well. Just the kindness which you have to other companies. You and this together, don't be so competitive. Now, how can you know, we work together? I told a story yesterday that um, I get some interesting in invitations sometimes and one of the most interesting ones which I got recently was to give the keynote address. You know, the keynote address at a big conference is actually set the theme of the conference. And that was a 2019 World Computer Conference in South Korea, in Daejeon. And they have some amazing computer engineers. I know one person I was talking to, he was the head of the European Union Cybersecurity. A really important job. And he was there at this conference, and he asked me, what are you doing here? You're a monk. What does a monk know about computers? One thing, I'm always honest, I say, very little. <laughs> well, why are you giving the keynote address? And that's where I told him a story which happened at the St. Louis World's Fair over a hundred years ago now. That there were, like you have in these big events, people need to eat. So they had the guy who had this, the franchise for ice cream. His store was right next to the person selling waffles. And you know, many days they were working there, one selling ice cream, the other one selling waffles. And after a while they started talking together. 
once they started talking together, they had this wonderful idea of combining a waffle with an ice cream. You know what it's called these days? Ice cream cone. <laughs> That's where it came from. The St. Louis World's Fair. It was good luck, the waffle guy was next to the ice cream guy. And they combined two types of food which no one ever could see, you know, how something for breakfast and ice cream could all go together. So I told them that story. This is one of the reasons why I went to a place like that. A Buddhist monk who knows nothing about, um, I know about ice cream. You <laughs> 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 know, nothing about computers. What are you doing here? And they got it. Sometimes to have advances in our understanding, to have growth in technology, to have innovation. We need to see things from a different angle. And that's why getting a Buddhist monk to go to these conferences, you can see it in a slightly different way. And that was the most important part of why I was there. And that was actually really good, because they, you know, all the way to South Korea from Australia, they got me business class tickets, put me up in a five-star hotel, and they must have liked what I talked about, because they gave a $2,000 donation to monastery afterwards. Nice little learner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna employ you as my manager. <laughs> no, I was very happy with that. That was amazing. I never expected that. You talk about ethics and artificial learning and, and machine learning and the future. I think maybe that was this. AI, and um, you know, if we can get the, yeah. the, the Buddhist philosophy into AI, you know, we're going to have many humane machines in the future. Indeed, yeah. Because even now, just with AI, especially with even like cars, you know, the driverless vehicles, all sort of, you know, how do you do that? And just, I, I didn't do anything like that. You've only got 15 minutes to do your your speech, but one of the things which I did do, I held up that glass of water. How heavy is the glass of water? Somebody who's here, they saw me in uh, London School of Economics, wasn't it? Where are you? No, not like LSE, the um, Imperial College. That was you, was it? Yeah, remember I held up the glass of water, how heavy is this? And of course there was the Imperial College in London, there's some very smart sort of scientists there, Somebody put their hand up and said, I reckon 180 grams. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that's not the point. <laughs> How heavy does it feel? Is the longer you hold it, the heavier it feels. And if you hold it for too long, your arm gets so tired and weak, you can't hold it very well at all. So you put it down, you let it go for a while. Only a couple of minutes, then you pick it up again, it feels lighter. I said, this is one of the problems, whether it's artificial intelligence or whatever. If you keep on going for too long, you don't know how to let go and take a rest. Your brain gets stuffed, it gets fried. Even many kids. You look at some of your kids, you know, 17, 18, 19, they're doing some assignment on their computer, and they're, they're just sitting there. Their brain is not working. Every, I was a school teacher, I know that you had to have your morning break, your lunch and your afternoon break, because the brain can't take work, 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 work. Its productivity goes down, its clarity goes down, you can't produce. You're overstressing your mind. I don't know how many people in this world stress out and they burn out. Why? Do you have to do that? Is there an alternative? And I reckon there is. To have the courage and the ability when you get tired to say no and take a break for 15 or 20 minutes. And if you take a break for 15 or 20 minutes and you really know how to relax and not think about anything for 15 or 20 minutes, then Harvard Business School who took this up called it an investment of time. In other words, you give 15 or 20 minutes to meditation. You're not productive at all at that time. 
but afterwards your productivity goes up, your clarity goes up. I know personally, I know many examples of people who have the greatest breakthroughs. One of those guys was Professor Josephson from Cambridge University, quantum tunneling. He found that out, discovered all the maths behind it after meditating. He got a Nobel Prize for that. It's big time. You, get, you can see things in a different way. You can actually have more clarity of mind. And I know myself that you know sometimes you've got to do an email, you've got to write to somebody. Sometimes it's a difficult email, what are you going to say? There are times when you get on your computer and just nothing comes out. In other words, your brain is stuffed, you've been working too hard. So I relax, rest, and then when I turn on the computer afterwards, it's amazing just how all these ideas come up. And all the language becomes much clearer. The quality of your work and the quickness which you can write it improve enormously. <coughs> That's one of the reasons why just learning how to rest just for half an hour and it improves your work, your productivity enormously. Yeah. I want to ask you a question. Great to see you both. Um, when you talk about forgiveness, even when you talk about yeah. forgiveness, sometimes, um, if I think about myself, if someone yeah. said, you've got to forgive, or yeah. the prospect of saying that to somebody that's been through some Sometimes it feels very not very compassionate to say that to somebody. I know there's a yeah. process, and I know it's compassionate yeah. to forgive yeah. for yourself. Yeah. But it doesn't always sound right. Yeah, I understand you there. That's why that you should never go into a meeting with somebody, either even thinking for yourself, or with somebody who's really been suffering, and telling people what to do. You've got to be more sneaky than that. <laughs> and just start to suggest. Now that's one of the reasons I like telling stories. I figured this out many years ago, that life is not a philosophy. The life is a series of stories. And in those stories of real life, there you can find meaning. You never find the final meaning, because life is like a work in progress for most people. So you say, this is not going to totally solve your problems. But maybe just try this little bit of forgiveness this little bit of kindness, this little bit of letting go, and then see where they go from that. You just suggest that, because you can't tell people what to do. Some people are so rebellious, you tell them what to do, and I deliberately do the opposite. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, okay. But after a while, I've noticed this in myself and others. You make a suggestion, and they say, that's ridiculous, that won't work. But you make the suggestion anyway, and then they can't stop thinking about it. So you say, how about a little bit of forgiveness? They know it doesn't work. They say, oh yeah, you're right. They, they start thinking about it. There was this lady, and she was a, a psychologist, and we needed someone to stand as the... Uh, the president of our Buddhist society in Western Australia. I approached her, because she'd be really competent, and I said, can you please be our president next year? Can you stand for election? You know what she said? She said, no, I'm too busy. And I had to think very quickly. And I said, oh, actually, yeah, you are right. I shouldn't have asked you that. I'm supposed to be more kind and compassionate to you. Please forgive me. Now, look, I know how kind you are. You probably feel a little bit guilty about refusing this, but look, I want to let you know you're banned from being the president next year. I won't allow it. <laughs> <laughs> it worked! <laughs> she became our president for the next two years. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to be sneaky sometimes. That's how to get me to come to England. Yeah, no, you can't come. I can't come, I'm too busy. <laughs> and then you stay for a few years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then I'll be next year. <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> okay.
There was another question over there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, was that really stuffing when you related kindfulness to restlessness? Oh, yeah. And I just kind of reflect on that a little bit. If you could say anything more, just like help help bring that into like really thinking about like if I was just going to, you know, yeah. Yeah, turning it into like how I can go there. It's, it's yeah. Helpful research. Not go there, but be here. Okay, so look, um, I c can't understand how someone can be restless. You're here. What are you aware of right now? Restless means you don't want to be here, you think you should be somewhere else. You are here. All restlessness, I'm supposed to be watching my breath, I'm supposed to be aware of my body, I'm supposed to be aware of kindness, but I'm aware of something else. You are aware, but you can somehow judge that you're aware of what you're not supposed to be aware of. In other words, you're trying to control your mind. In mind, don't be aware of over here, be aware of over there. And you interpret that as restlessness. So where are you right now? What are you aware of? That's the old Emperor's Three Questions me uh, meditation. I love that description of meditation simply because it's simple and highly effective and a bit rebellious. It was taught by Tolkien, not by the Buddha. Sorry? Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, not Tol Tolkien, Tolstoy. <laughs> <laughs> I got the first bit right. <laughs> I told somebody. <laughs> and anyway, the Empress Three Questions, I think many of you may know it. When is the most important time? No. no, easy. That's the only time you ever have. Who is the most important person? Oh, okay, you know my stories. <laughs> but when I first read that, I thought, yourself. <laughs> no. You're not the most important person in the world. It's whoever is right in front of you right now. And as soon as I heard that, that really blew, blew my mind again. How many times? As I was a young student, I was talking about something interesting, as far as I was concerned, to the professor who just given a lecture, and the professor was just trying to get rid of me. He wasn't listening at all. I wasn't important to him. I was only this small young student. And I thought that was, that was a terrible feeling. And even, look I'm saying this now, some of you in a marriage, in a relationship, how many of you have experienced your partner trying to get rid of you, not giving you importance, not listening to you. Your partner. <laughs> Sorry, you got me. <laughs> Very good. You got me there. And when that actually happens to you, you know, it means that you know you're not respected. So whoever's in front of you right now, they're the most important person in the whole world. You had your hand up. Can I answer the question? Yeah. Yeah, it was just in following on from yeah. this, this lady who's just spoken yeah. about the meditation and you were saying about controlling like your, um, your attention's there and your mind have your attention there. Yeah. So then from that, I'm imagining that you just let your mind just completely <laughs> want. You don't quite let your mind completely wander. You're with your mind wherever it wanders. And you are aware and kind at the same time. The kindness, the caring is also crucial. The one in front of you is the most important person in the whole world. And the only thing to do is to care. Not to cure, but to care for this moment. And that creates so much peace and stillness. The mind goes to many places at first of all, but then it stops. It stays still, because you're kind to it. Wherever it goes, you go with it. Companion. Companion, yes, a best friend. And sometimes my mind just wants to go over here and go over there. Fine, I'm going with you. And after a while, it's like it, 
I don't feel like it's testing me out. Do you really care for me? And then after a while, sort of, you know, realize it does. I might go anywhere. You're with your very, very best friend. You, you hang out together. So that empress three questions. Now the most important time, the one in front of you, the experience in front of you, the object in front of you, is the most important meditation object in the whole world. And you care for it. It might be testing you, wandering here and there first of all, but you're totally with it, by its side, best companion. And after a while it settles down and you're with it. And that's how the mind becomes peaceful. Yeah? Yeah, I'm going to ask a question. I could like, I'd like to ask a question about me as well. Okay. It's a question about me. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's normal. Um, I'm going to ask a question about the we, but the, the, the younger we, the children. Oh, yeah. Um, and how to bring them on the path to mm. Buddhism and, and all the offers the Dharma and the Sangha. Um, I'm, not, I'm not really sure, but I, I understand that I'm not really sure how to introduce them because it, they're few and far between the, the Theravada uh, yeah. sites in the UK. There are, uh, yeah. there are a few other yeah. uh, common offshoots of, of many, yeah. many Buddhism in the, yeah. the UK. So, um, just wondering, what, what's your suggestion for, I mean, we're here, but I see we're, 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 yeah. we are a bunch of believers or many of us, and we're very lucky to have a couple of young yeah. people here, but uh, I'm interested in the, the, the young we's that you want here, how can we get them to be a mindful and kindful. Yeah. Yes, now first of all, this is an old saying, but it's a very important one. The two things which you must encourage your children to do is to ask questions and to be honest. Because then if they ask questions, you actually encourage them, just even to mummy and daddy or to monks, ask the question. And the question will always be respected. And then the honesty which you encourage in your children will mean if they get a stupid answer, an answer which makes no sense to them, they will reject it. Even if you know, they disagree with daddy. Fine, you're allowed to disagree with daddy. So you're empowering them to find their own path in life. And to be mindful and kind they usually imitate their parents. If they see you meditating, they will like to meditate too. I always tell people that, please don't just put a couple of cushions in the bedroom, have a place, a room, or like this couple over in Perth had the room under the stairs, that was their meditation place. And they banned their children from going in there. What happens if your partner's um Cold towards your interest in, uh, and, and, and following and passion for both of them, uh, and who moves it and who looks it. Okay. How, how does that work in, in, a, in an environment? That's a great suggestion about having uh, a, a space for you yeah. to. Well, anyway, just, I'll just finish the story, then answer the second part of the question. They had two kids, and they got a four year old girl and about a six year old boy, and they told me that they'd banned their kids from going in that room because then they, they wouldn't understand what meditation was. But then they saw their two kids <coughs> having a fight outside. And it was the first time the, the, their son hit their daughter. And she was just so sort of confused emotionally. She started weeping and she ran into the room underneath the stairs. Because for her, she could feel it was safe and peaceful. So you have a resource like that, and your kids, they know it's a good resource, and they will make use of it. And if you have a partner, this has happened so many times, that you, know, that you come on a retreat, and then afterwards you're like, what are you going on a retreat for? I'm so busy, I need you at home, look after the kids. You go on a retreat, and if it's a good retreat, your partner will notice that you're a much finer husband after you come back from a retreat. That's like sending your car for a service. <laughs> Wives, you're sending your husband for a service. And the kids notice too. So many times, people, you know, these mothers have come uh, to one of these meditation evenings 
And then they, they told me, they said, I came back from work really late and I was tired, exhausted. And my kids said, Mummy, you're going to meditation tonight? I said, no, I don't feel like it. Mummy, you must go to meditation. Look, I don't want to. Mummy, you must go to meditation. Why? Because you're a much nicer mummy when you come home from meditation. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Great. So, are you okay? We've got about 15 minutes and we're going to talk about why we're here. Uh, maybe one last question then we talk. Yeah? Uh, Ajahn, from our minds, why do, why do we usually go to the negative things that happen to us instead of the positive? It's because we're being conditioned to always think about the negative. It's, you know, the old two bad bricks in the wall, which your son knows very well. And why is it? This really shocked me. The story behind the two bad bricks in the wall. You know, I was a theoretical physicist. And then I became a monk and studied the Dhamma. And then we had to build a monastery in Australia. I had no, we had no money. So I had to learn how to lay bricks. I had all the time. But I wasn't a good bricklayer. And so, when I finished the first wall, there were two crooked bricks. So what would you do? I was ashamed. Wasted money. And everyone could see those two crooked bricks. So I tried to scrape the, the mortar out to redo them. It was solid, it was like concrete. And then, so I asked, can we get some dynamite to blow up the wall so I can start again? I was ashamed. And then this guy came along three months later. I suffered for about three months. And then this guy came along, he saw that wall, he said it was a beautiful wall. I couldn't believe what he said. Can you see the two bad bricks? And they said, yes, but I could also see the 998 perfect bricks. I couldn't see those until the guy pointed it out to me. And that was the amazing thing. Why was I judging wall a war by two mistakes and not seeing the 998 good bricks. Even recently in the uh, Thames Buddhist Vihara in London, you know, one of the boys there committed suicide about a couple of weeks ago. And the people were just so upset. He was only 16 years of age. So they asked me to talk about it. And I said, what kind of boy was he? He was a very lovely boy, very kind, very gentle, a very good son. And he said, and I said, look, the similar thing happened to a 17 year old in Australia, just before he did the university entrance exams. And I asked them, how many exams, would, how many subjects was he doing? It's about five subjects two papers in every subject, about eight questions in every paper. So he's going to answer 80 questions. And I told the parents, what would happen if he you know, did that examination, the final examination, and 79 questions he answered perfectly, and the one last question he messed up? Would he still go to university? 79 out of 80 is a pretty good score. So why do we just focus on the last thing your son did, which was suicide, and judge his whole life on that? That's irrational, unreasonable. We never do that. If you're going to judge a kid at all, judge him on his whole life, everything he's done. And then you find he wasn't such a bad kid. Why does one bad thing happen, and then we focus on that? And honestly, there was one of the, uh, the prisoners over in our local jail. He'd read my book, heard my stories. And the other monks were telling me, he's going around now saying he's, he's made, um, he's at peace with what he's done now. He's going around saying, there's only two murders, only two bad bricks, only two people murdered. <laughs> But actually, I was very happy about that. Two terrible things he's done, but it doesn't make him a murderer. 
There's many other kind things he's done. But why do we focus so much on the mistakes? It's hard for us to focus on our good qualities. Because, no, they're just, okay, we want to fix up the bad qualities so we can make it better. But please never forget the beautiful good qualities of yourself and of life. Look at this country. When you look at England, or the whole of the UK, do you see its wonderful good qualities? Or do you think all the things we're doing wrong? <laughs> what do you see? You see the government. What do you see? Their mistakes? All the wonderful things which they're doing. Sometimes, in my position, sometimes you get to know a few senior politicians, presidents, and I must admit, the only uh, leader of a country I've ever felt um, afraid of was Hun Sen in Cambodia, the Khmer Republic. He felt a really dodgy guy. Now, I met um, uh, Rajapaksa many years ago. You know, he invited me to the palace when he was president. He served me breakfast with his own hand. I'll never forget, he served me baked beans. <laughs> Traditional Sri Lankan dish, it wasn't Sri Lankan dish at all. But when he came out from his bed and saw me, what he actually said, I like sharing this, he first said, I'm a failure. Yeah. And this was, um, he was so popular, the, he hadn't so concluded the war with the Tamil Tigers, he hadn't even really started it. But he said he came in, he told me personally, came into politics to try and find a peaceful solution. He said he couldn't find one. And just the pressure on him was to start the military option. And that's why he said it was a failure. And I must admit that he said that with so much what I took to be honesty. And I actually took it as actually true. Many politicians, please don't ever become a politician, it's just a terrible job. <laughs> and sometimes the pressures on you are enormous. So because of that, that's one of the reasons why people get sort of branded by doing terrible, terrible things. Anyway, we see negativity all the time. No one's perfect. That's why if you see 70% politician, that's good enough. You can't have a 100% one. Even um, Mahatma, yeah, it was Mahatma Gandhi. No, it was it Nelson Mandela? You know, he, no, Mahatma, no, it wasn't Mahatma Gandhi. He was the one who just still maintained the caste system in India which was, you know, kind of unacceptable. But he did so many other good things. Well done. Anyway, uh, I can keep going on as you know. So, one of the reasons we're here is because I think many people know that the, uh, the nun next to me, she is a fully ordained uh, woman, a bhikkhuni, we call them, I'm a bhikkhu, I'm a monk, she's a nun, to put it slightly. <laughs> and how many fully ordained bhikkhunis do you think there are in England? One. 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 Yeah. Even in your order. Yeah, well, it's not my order. Oh, it's Buddhist order. Yeah, but in other nuns, in other Buddhist orders. They're not fully ordained. But I don't yeah. know if there are any actually. Yeah. It might be, but it will be very few. So, so? In the UK. Yeah. In the UK. We have lots of bhikkhunis in Australia. 
Well, more than that, maybe we're 20, 20 uh, and over in, they're in Melbourne as well. We've probably got about 25 over there. And also, that we have some in Sri Lanka. Yeah. Yeah, in fully ordained we have a few, but they don't get uh, even recognition from the government. And in Thailand, there are several bhikkhunis. They are not recognized by their government either. But they're there anyway. Good on them. And so because of that, you know, I was born in this country, grew up in this country, and I was responsible for the ordination of quite a few bhikkhunis. It's been very successful. I also feel responsible. When a woman came up to me, I forget who she was, and she told me that so Buddhism, a Theravada Buddhism especially, is very, very dark, that's right, very dark for women in this country. And when she said that, that really hit me hard. I thought I should do something. That's one of the reasons why we started this Anukampa Bhikkhuni project. To try and get some equity in this country. And because of that, you know, we started in Oxford. A Vihara, which we now own, the Anukampa Bhikkhuni project. It's, it's a great thing. And how long have you been living there? In two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I have seven years with nowhere to Yeah. Now we've got at least a place. Yeah. But be careful because once you have a place and you have a Bhikkhuni, it's not the end of the road yet. We haven't reached success yet. You've got to look after her. In other words, make sure she's well fed. And she's not burnt out. Because many people go and offer food, and then they expect like free counseling for about three or four hours. So, one of the nice things about you know, Buddhism over in uh, traditional monastic Buddhism is many people would go and support and you know, offer alms food, make sure that she has something to eat, and any other services. They would understand, they get the message that you know, to look after a nun, to feed her, takes many people, and she cannot just give you all the attention you would love to have. Otherwise, that causes burnout. Over in Australia, I have many monks uh, in Bodhinyana Monastery. That's why I can leave for two or three weeks, so I know everything's going okay over there. The other monks can look after the jobs and the busyness. I you know for her there's only one so far. I'm sure there'll be more later on at any given time. But please look after her. Make sure that again she has enough rest and she's not burnt out. Otherwise you have she's like a little fragile plant. <laughs> she's been a big cookie for many years. So is there a structure for the day or something so people don't encroach on her time all the time so that we can offer food and we can get half an hour of time off? Yeah, absolutely. That is, yeah. This is why it's very nice to start something because uh, as bikinis we can kind of create things from scratch. We're not tied so much to one tradition so because the bikini sangha was kind of absent from the world for many, many years thousands of years, um, we tend to take the Buddhist texts as our guide. Mm -hmm. And so in the Buddhist times, most of the duties were like that the monastics would work during the mornings and people would help and then the lay community would offer food and come uh, to visit, to make merit and to feel happiness by increasing their virtue and providing that dana. And then the monastic sangha, in exchange, will offer spiritual counsel and guidance, and also just somewhere quiet to come where you can be yourself, you know, you can be with yourself, and also be with other spiritual parents. So there would be some kind of structure, which is obviously in process at the moment, whereby you would offer the food and then have meet with the monastics after lunch. And then my idea is to have like a silent afternoon where we can practice. 
because obviously the whole purpose of being a monastic is not to say, hey, women can do it too, but it's more to actually give women, and especially people committed to the Dhamma, the opportunity to really deepen on the path, so that we can also provide teachings at a deeper level, you know, than somebody who's practicing part-time. So, so it's always that balance, I think, you know, for monastics as well as for lay people, right, to find that beautiful balance between service and practice. I just returned from Sri Lanka after a um, two-week retreat uh, in uh, Mithirika with right. Venerable Ramji. And their monastery has uh, quite plenty of time for, um, for the big course to practice sure. and even their time. Sure. But they, because there's a, such a, uh, like a structure there, a good structure, yeah. You know, when you're talking about structure in that way, yeah. we're talking about the inequities in terms of support because the bhikkhu sangha have a lot of support, they have a lot of um, respect mm -hmm. from the lay community, mm -hmm. and they don't have to do admin, they don't have to run their own places, they don't have to educate the public about why it's important to have bikinis. I'm doing all of that. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to structure in that sense, we have to start from the grassroots and actually um, build a system whereby women have an opportunity. So that's what we're doing now. So of course it's much busier because we don't get the same support. Yeah, and um, then because you're the only person. Yeah, yeah. There, then you have to cover everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just bookings, website, newsletters, events. I organized yeah. all of this. So yeah. Um, I'm taking some time off, like from work, from next year, I'm taking a day off, uh, so I'm very happy to help with well, that. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. And it's this kind of support that we need, because it's not just that I need support, it's about community coming together to create and another opportunity to practice, for everybody's sake. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it is actually, it is historic. Buddhist um, animals spoke to Mark. Who was the first Bhikkhuni who came to Sri Lanka? Sunday. And what did she bring? The uh, Bodhi tree, tree, yeah. Indeed. Mm -hmm. So, all these things, you know, for me anyway, it's amazing to think in such historic times mm -hmm. where you're actually bringing uh, Bhikkhunis to the UK. Mm -hmm. They were part of it. And there's a very good card, this is big stuff. Mm -hmm. John went to Australia the first time, yeah. serpent on that environment, it was yourself and the, the, the father above you before you. Yeah. Um, how many monks did Ajahn Chah send at that time? Why did monks to set up the two to yourself and the, yeah. the, the abbot at the time? Yeah. What did they do? So, they have a big sample pool. Yeah, yeah. They have many they can send because yeah. I think you were like the fourth, third or fourth. Like one went before and came back. Yeah, yes, that's what I know. Perhaps the third. Third, okay. Yeah. That's the difficulty for beginners yes. because yeah, yeah. there are so few of us. Yeah. So I have some friends in California. I have some friends in Australia, but they're all needed in their respective roles in the monastery. So this is why a lot of uh, burden falls on. You know, individual nuns, and not only myself, but all the nuns who are kind of in that beginning start-up role. And that's why a lay sangha is, is essential. Yeah, absolutely, and also people who want that opportunity to ordain. People that are looking also, maybe not to ordain, but just to live longer in uh, monasteries as um, as a practice of the whole eightfold path. Because I think many of us consider retreats as good places to go to deepen our practice. But then the question is often like, how do we apply that in daily life? And the monastery is kind of like a bridge between the two. You know, it's a place you can come and you can really integrate what you've learned on retreat with like the service in daily life, like speech, like relationships with you know wise companions on the path. So it offers that opportunity as well. And I think it's when there are enough people, you know, when there's a certain number, I can imagine that's when it's going to really grow. So. We're at that point now, you know, in this room there are quite a few people who've been coming to my talks and Ajahn Brahm's tours for many years, and uh, we all somehow have this connection now, we start to know each other and we meet each other, and uh, this is for me the whole essence of what I'm doing.
Because he has to spend, like, yes. Buddhism has to represent everybody. It has to. And not I touched only. on that with the children earlier, but yeah. Yeah. it's a weird thing that we yeah. would have a strong belief in faith. Yeah. But it's passing the torch, is it? I don't yeah. know, it's expanding the, the people to realize yeah. that the value it has. Exactly. The value it has for, for, for all people to to reduce that suffering that, that people, every person everywhere is suffering. Exactly. And yeah. there is yeah. there is often a way. Exactly. Exactly. And that you know, the more teachers we have, the more representative as well those teachers are of like society as a whole, the more people are gonna come in contact with the teachings because we have different connections with different people at different times. Yeah, that equity across society of, of, of Buddhists. It's not just a, a, a certain demographic. Right. So, I'm, so you've just come back from Australia, so you've been in a very supportive environment, and that's a bit I'm hearing. Yes. <laughs> Is that you find you're going to go back? Mm -hmm. I know. So, uh, yeah, Rick, that's what I'm, I'm hearing. I think we need to support you because you're gonna yeah. your support. I know it's there, but it's not there anymore. Yeah. So, what I mean, I was a part of the you know, three years in the, in the lockdown and how you were really leaned on. Yeah, and I was leaned on. supported. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, it's, it's, yeah. it's just, so I'm hearing Ajahn talk. You know, I'm wondering. I don't know how to do that other than. One way is the moral support and the practice and coming to our stuff. Yeah. Then there's opportunities to serve. I mean, I think at this stage in the project, I'd like to bring it more inward from the like distant support. Distant support is still important. People can serve in different roles, you know, remotely. Mm -hmm. But I want to create more of a local feeling so that people there. Yeah. Um, because otherwise, I just I'm endlessly writing emails, like sometimes 14 to 16 hours a day, just coordinating all the different teams, and, you know, all the admin, and, yeah. like social media, and the whole lot. Um, so I think it's about starting to have people come and stay, and um, yeah, there are different ways to be involved. So there's the remote, there's the on the ground, there's the offering food, there's the practice, coming to meditate and retreat, um, maybe organising events, helping organise, things like Ajahn's talk. Um, yeah, what else? What else? Where are you based? Oxford at the moment. But the reason we're in Stroud, actually, is because um, we kind of want to be here. <laughs> <laughs> At least this is one place that's very interesting to me. Because I want somewhere that has a connection to like bigger cities, like in here you're not so far from Birmingham, Bristol, London's direct train. Oxford's still not very far. We came Southwest. today, it's not far. Um, and somewhere accessible but also peaceful you know where you have the countryside and you feel like you can just get away from the world a little bit and so yeah we're trying to get some new stroud actually instead of oxford i've been renting in oxford before but the prices have just everybody who lives here knows they've just almost doubled in the last three or four years so we're still kind of aiming for that in the long term but it's all about how many people i have with me like I need a couple of people who are long term invested in this with me uh, to form community before we can kind of expand. So, yeah, Oxford at the moment though, and it's a very pretty part of the city, quiet place to live, and river walks. We have Oxford. We bought it. We actually bought it. I mean, thanks to Ajahn's incredible support over like seven years and all the teaching that you've been doing for us and everything that you inspired in me as well, in the sense that I can feel able to share. Um, we've actually raised enough funds from, I'm sure many people here, you know, people all over the world actually. So we actually purchased it, so it's in the hands of the Bikuni Sangha Trust, which is why it's such a historic time, yeah, that we have something solid to go from. Yeah, absolutely. The only thing there is with my Vinaya rules that if it's just myself and one man, then it, I need a female chaperone. But so long as the space and I have like a female guest as well, then men can come. Transgender people, gay people, any people 
can come. I'd have any animals, but I don't think I can get away with that either. <laughs> yes, yeah, so definitely. We have not on meetings to carry on. Yes, we will continue doing our meetings. It's just with all my own work at the moment. It's kind of, I'm going to have to shift the focus a little bit, but I'm going to be having like every Friday the Sutta class. One of the things I'm really pleased about with my online teaching, which I've been doing for about three years, about three times a week throughout Corona, the Corona pandemic, we've had a group of about 50, 60 people who've been regular throughout that time, so we've developed this lovely community, many of you here have been to that. Um, and one of the things I'm really happy about is people start getting interested in the suttas, in the Buddha's teachings, and we were discussing like how they apply to our daily life, and you know, people were really getting kind of straight into the Buddha's teachings, which I think is mm -hmm. fantastic in a largely secular kind of Buddhist scene. Yeah, so you're welcome. Everybody's welcome to join that. And it's a very friendly group. Very welcome. We just share quite openly what's affecting us in our lives and how we can apply the teachings to that. And we have meta meditation quite often. We have blessings and dedications on Wednesday, Dhamma talks. Um, yeah, I've not actually given a Dhamma talk since mm -hmm. my long retreat. I was on retreat in Perth for about six months. In a very beautiful secluded uh, in the forest. And uh, so, yeah, I'm just warming up. Mm -hmm. And I also just want to thank everybody because we do talk about how much more is needed quite often. And that's true. But also to look at how far we've come from literally nothing. I remember, you know, when we first um, set up like a bank account with the very first trustees. And the first ten pounds donation came in, and I was like, "Oh my goodness, somebody donated to us! Like they know we exist." <laughs> and it was so exciting, you know, to get the first donation. Something like seven years ago, actually. So it's quite amazing, and thank you to everybody who supports and who's interested in it, because it is um, preserving Buddhism, the teachings of the Dhamma for generations. You know, that was the Buddha's wish. Any other questions? I think so. Hi. How long does it take a good community to become for the North End? Yeah, it really depends on um, a person's good fortune, I would say, because unlike for monks who can go to Thailand or Sri Lanka or anybody's country and take bhikkhu, take full ordination within a couple of months or even a couple of days. Um, for women, it often takes years. I mean, for me, it took a whole decade before I could take um, ordination as an eight preset nun, simply because there weren't many opportunities. Um, so many bikinis have actually been nuns for a lot longer than they've been fully ordained nuns. Uh, but if you're lucky enough to go to a monastery where they do give full ordination, then it takes probably at least a year or two of exploring different places, spending time as a lay person in one <coughs> and then one year as an anagarika on eight precepts. Do you know the precepts? It's like, yeah, a trainee kind of, you're sort of still a lay person, but you're living in a monastery supporting the community there. And then two years as a novice, and then you can take the full ordination if you're lucky enough to find a full sangha because you need a whole group of bhikkhunis and also bhikkhus, monks and nuns, to perform the ordination. So it's a lot harder for women, but it's getting easier bit by bit. Yeah. My mind is thinking, I think it's Iris Santisica. Santisica. Sorry, yeah. my apologies. I, I, I'm not sure because it is historical, I can't remember exactly, but am I right in thinking that the, the precepts that were given to bhikkhunis are more comprehensive than you? We have more. Yeah. yeah, we have so, 700 million. Sorry? Yeah. We have more. We have more, yeah. 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 So we should go ahead of the big things. We should go ahead of the big things in the line. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. What would you say about that? Well, there's some of the extra rules are specific for women. 
and uh, sometimes they don't apply to the men. There's some rules for the men the women don't have. And so, because of that, it is um, all of those rules are not really burdensome if you understand where they come from and how to adapt them. So, in other words, I've been keeping you know, for the monks. It's not just 227 rules; it's all the minor rules as well. We should now try and keep the best we possibly can. But a lot of the rules has come down to being uh, being peaceful, being simple, and just being kind. We share those rules together. And, and they're not rules as such in sort of the Christian sense, are they? Commandments, they're not. Like, yeah. I'm afraid it's up to uphold. Yeah. I think of it as training. Training in restraint yeah. is how I like to think of it. Because Vinaya actually means kind of restraint. And as we know with the precepts, when we chant the precepts, we say, Sikati means I undertake the training to observe. So I think of them as training, as in restraining the mind, and as I just says, living simply and peacefully in kind. And it's very much a living system, you know, that's why there are different numbers of rules, because they arose in response to situations at that time. So the Vinaya is not something that's like imposed on you and is rigid and stiff and intractable. It's something that has to be applied with wisdom. And it comes back to what Ajahn said over to about children, about children that ask questions and brothers are being the religion, which is encouraging yes. to ask questions, or other religions are, are a little bit say a general answer to that question. If you think it's really appropriate, then you share. Some lay people may use that against you afterwards. Or some even monks may use that against you if you say a few weaknesses you have. But for most people you can trust. Then it's wonderful to share with somebody else. And then because when you share with somebody else you're also listening to what you're saying. It makes you know your weaknesses much more apparent to you and then that other person may be able to help not criticize and say you know you're a terrible monk or you're a terrible lay person or a terrible nun I understand what you're going through maybe we can help to find a solution to that you should never be embarrassed about your faults it is yes because people are going anyway yeah. And so sometimes you give a talk and you're the last person in the room. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, good. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you very much. Should we do the three big sad? Okay, yeah. Sadi. 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 And what does sadu mean? Awesome. <laughs> And you can find the information about us outside. We'll come out there and yeah. have a few more words. Right?